Okay, my aim is to give the shortest introduction at all times, of all times. Okay, welcome everybody. You two guys are sitting in the last row. You're not gonna see anything, come forward. I'm serious, talking to you two guys. Yeah, you two, okay? All right, um, please interrupt at any moment and ask questions. Don't wait until the end, okay? If you don't ask any questions, I will turn around and frown at you. Um, and, um, uh, what's that? Yes, you have to ask questions, in fact. Otherwise, no food. Uh, okay, um, you know, really, it's important. Otherwise, what's the point? You could just as well be on video. Uh, oh, yeah, we have remote participants, so it's important that when you ask a question, you remind the speaker to repeat the question. Okay, for the remote people, I will, um, you know, I will put in the chat uh, all the Zoom etiquette that we're following. Um, okay, I hope you have a wonderful time. It's so great to be together in person. Jen, I'm not going to introduce you. All right. Paul, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's good to see all of you. Um, wait, so uh, I'll be talking about Hager flow homology. So um, I'm a low dimensional topologist. I study um, three manifolds, four manifolds, knots and surfaces inside of them. And for the next three lectures, I'm going to tell you about my favorite tool for studying these objects. Uh, namely, Hager flow homology. So this is a package of invariants defined by um, Oshvath and Zabo about uh, 20 years ago now. Um, great. Okay, and so um, what does this invariant do? So to a uh, three-manifold, uh, so all of our three-manifolds are going to be um, closed, connected, oriented. Um, so to a three manifold, we get um, an algebraic object. Uh, so I'll mostly be talking about um, the minus flavor. So to a three manifold Y, we associate HF minus of Y. So what kind of algebraic object is this? This is a uh, graded uh, F. Um, so whenever I write um, blackboard bold F, That'll be the field with two elements. Um, so it's a graded F adjoining U module. So, so graded module over a polynomial ring in one variable. Um, and the degree of U is minus two. Um, great. Uh, so I said you can also use this to study four manifolds. So uh, what does that look like? So suppose you have a four manifold uh, cobordism W. Um, so it's a cobordism, say, from y naught to y1. So what does that mean? It means that the boundary of W is minus y naught disjoint union y1. And so to a four-manifold cobordism, well, we get a map between the Hager flow homologies of the, of the boundaries. So this induces a map, which I'll denote Fw. Um, and this goes from Hf minus of y naught to hf minus of y1. Um, this is a module homomorphism. Um, maybe if I wanted to be really careful, I should say something about spin C structures on the cobordism and on the three manifolds. But sort of today, for sort of the first pass, I'll maybe ignore some of those details. But, but if, you, if you're worried about that and you know about that, then yes, I'm sort of ignoring some of that for the sake of sort of having cleaner statements to give people the, the lay of the land. <clears throat> All right. Um, and this behaves, this behaves nicely. So for example, if W is just a product cobordism, then it induces the identity map. And suppose you have two cobordisms where they, they line up on one end and you stack them together. Well, then the composition of those maps is going to be the same as sort of if you just viewed that as one big cobordism. So it sort of has these nice properties. <coughs> um, what else? Uh, so to a not uh, k in y, well, we also get an invariant associated to that. Um, the, the version that I'll be talking about this week, um, I'll write it. Uh, HF K, oh, right, this works in maybe any three manifold. Um, so uh, maybe let's say null homologous. 
Um, great. And so um, what type of algebraic gadget is this? Well, this is a uh, graded module. Um, it has more structure than the three-manifold three invariant. This is a graded module over a polynomial of random two variables. Great. OK. And then um, similarly, well, suppose you have a co Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so um, Paul asks, what's the degree of V? Um, wait, so this is actually a bi-graded module. And so um, we have two gradings. One grading is called the gradient, the U grading. And um, the U grading of U is minus 2. And the U grading of V is 0. And there's also a V grading. And then you just flip these. Other questions? Hopefully Paul won't be the only person asking questions today. If he, if he is, I'll be very sad. And then he'll just have to look at my sad face all week. <coughs> all right. Um, well, OK, you might, maybe you'll have a cobordism of pairs. <coughs> Great, so that's a four manifold W and let's say a surface S. Uh, from y naught k naught to y1 k1. So this just means, well, the boundary of w is minus y naught disjoint union y1. The boundary of s is, uh, let's say, minus k naught disjoint union k1. Well, again, this will induce a, a module homomorphism. So maybe, maybe the cartoon picture, right, say, say this is W, this is Y naught, this is Y1. Then you have uh, in my one color that looks different than white, I'll draw, let's say this is uh, K naught, and then you have some, maybe it has genus, and this is K1. So that's a cartoon picture of this. Okay. So uh, let me give you some examples. Great, so uh, what's the simplest three-manifold? Um, to me, it's S3. And um, it has sort of the simplest possible Hager for homology. Um, it's just the polynomial ring. And then um, I'll write my gradings like this. So this, when I write this zero subscript, um, and if you can't see the subscript, maybe you should move closer because I write my subscript small. Um, this tells us that the grading of 1 is 0. Um, and maybe as a remark, there's different grading conventions in the literature. I'm going to use this grading convention that um, it's, it's sort of not, you want like putting 1 and grading 0 is like the simplest thing that you could hope for. And you kind of want S3 to have the simplest thing. But just so you know in the literature, sometimes this is shifted by 2. Sometimes people say this is actually minus 2. So just be aware of that. that. That's my warning for all of you who ever go try to like actually prove a theorem with this and you're unhappy about the grading conventions. OK. Um, great. OK, so hopefully this is an interesting invariant. So hopefully some other three manifolds have different Hager floor homology. Um, so uh, HF minus of uh, the three score homology sigma 2, 3, 5. Um, so uh, note, this is also uh, plus one surgery on the uh, right-handed trefoil. It's a very nice three-manifold. Um, OK, well, it's Hager floor homology. It's also just this polynomial ring. But the, but the grading is zero, is, is different. Um, the grading of one is minus two. So Hager for homology can, can tell apart um, these two three manifolds. Great. Um, all right, so <clears throat> well, let's see. What about what about if I wanted to build a cobordism between these two three manifolds? Um, wait. So since sigma two three five is plus one surgery in the right-handed trefoil, well. <clears throat> um, this means that, uh, well, plus one surgery on the right-handed trefoil. 
Well, that's the boundary of the one trace of the right handed trefoil. So that's the boundary of what I'll denote um, x plus 1 of the right handed trefoil. Right, and so what is this? Well, this says take, take the four ball. OK, well, let's take, OK, so the boundary of the four ball is S3. Well, let's take our knot in S3. So I'm drawing a cartoon, so my knot is going to be in S0 in this cartoon. And then let's attach a um, plus one frame two handle along the knot, right? So a two handle is D2 cross D2, and then um, you attach it along an S1 cross D2, and so the plus one is telling you how to frame that bundle. And so I'll draw it like this. And then um, the boundary of this is going to be plus one surgery in the right hand and trefoil. So this is what I'll call x1 of k. OK, and then, then for whatever orientation convention reasons, um, I'll let w be, OK, I, I want to get a coordinate in between s3 and um, uh, plus one surgery in the right hand and trefoil. So I need to take this trace, and let's remove a four ball. And then because of the direction that I want things to go, I'm just going to overall reverse the whole orientation also. Great. OK, so now the way I've set this up, the boundary of this is minus um, this orientation reversal plus one surgery on the right-handed trefoil disjoint union S3. <coughs> um, so it's a cobordism uh, from here to here. And so this four manifold is going to induce a module homomorphism from here to here. It's a module homomorphism, so it respects the U action. Um, People can see if I write here. Yes, great. If you can't, then you missed your chance to speak up. OK. OK. <clears throat> um, great. And so um, this, this map, OK, so it goes from here to here, and um, in this example, it turns out this map is great in preserving. Um, so it sends the element one here to the element u here. So um, one gets sent to u. Another way you might draw that is I like to draw f adjoin u like this. So the vertical lines represent my u action. And then, um, great, so, and then I guess the way I've drawn it, the vertical placement is telling me something about the grading. So um, this is what the map looks like, and sort of, and then, right, it's u equivariant because you do u or you go across, or you go across and do u, you get the same thing. Questions? Yes. Oh. Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm, I've done a calculation and I'm just declaring, telling you this is the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the point, I'm, telling, I'm giving you some examples just so you can get sort of a flavor of what the invariant looks like. And then um, what's the plan after that? The plan is to um, sketch the definition of the invariants. And then um, in the later lectures, we'll talk about some properties of them. Oh, does this map always have to, yeah. Great. So the question was, do, do the cobordism the maps always preserve grading? And the answer is no. They don't always preserve grading. Um, uh, right. do they, they come with some extra structure, these spin C structures. And within each spin C structure, they're grading homogeneous, but possibly with a grading shift. Um. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. So the question was, yeah, so did, the question is, do the maps depend on the spin C structure? And the answer is yes. Um, I'm sort of, the, my, my aim in these lectures is sort of to give people like an overview of Hegel for homology. So at times, I'll maybe suppress some of the details in the ease of sort of like painting a broad picture. Um, Uh, do we know different manifolds with the same Higgard floor homology? Yes. Um, so for example, if you take plus one surgery on the trefoil and you connect sum it with its orientation um, reversal, yes. Um, 
this, the Hagerfeld homology of this um, looks like the Hagerfeld homology of S3. Um, and there's other examples, but this is maybe the first one that pops into my mind. Paul has another question. Thanks. Oh, because, the, yeah, <laughs> great. So why it's a map, the orientation reversal of W. So the way things are set up, right, if I have a, co a cobordism from Y naught to Y1, um, the, w sh the boundary of W should be minus Y naught, disjoint union Y1. And then um, at least my convention for building the trace, the boundary of the trace of K is going to be um, like, what, plus one surgery on K, and I wanted this cobordism to go from um, here to here, so that meant that minus plus one, minus the surgery had to be one of the boundary components. Oh, if you took the reverse. <laughs> the, the question was, what if you take the reverse of W? Right, then you get a cobordism from S3 to um, plus one surgery, and um, I I believe it's, the map is zero, but um, uh, I'm doing that quickly in my head early in the morning, so I don't know if that's to be trusted. But yeah, it's sort of different. It's, it's, not, it's not just some like dual or simple thing of this. More questions. If you ask more questions, I'll get used to repeating them. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah, I think, so the question was, can we say anything about the map induced by the other cobordism, so reversing the orientation? I think that was Josh's question. Um, and um, it's, not, it's, it's not just like the dual or something nice of this. Like, I mean, you, you, if you gave me a few minutes to sit down and do it, I could actually verify if it's zero as I claimed. Um, but yeah. I don't know if I understand the question. The other question, uh -huh. does it involve the homology? Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> the question was, does this cobordism map um, involve the homology orientation of the four manifold? Oh, mm. I think it does, but yeah, I'm not sure. More questions? Okay, so I've given you some examples of the three-manifold invariant. I've given you an example of a four-manifold cobordism and the map that it induces. Um, what about? Oh, great. Is there a non-trivial cobordism from a manifold to itself? that induces the identity. Mm. Probably, but um, does anyone in the audience want to volunteer one? Oh, great, yes, like the ribbon stuff, yes. Um, yeah, maybe that takes me further afield than I want to discuss right now. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. Um, next example. Uh, great. So the right hand of trefoil in S3. <coughs> great. Okay. Um, so I, I claim that this is, well, great. So to, to this, we're going to associate a chain complex whose chain homotopy type is an invariant of the isotopy type of R0. Um, Great. So for the three manifold invariant, right, we got out um, mod finitely generated modules over a PID. So those sort of are classified, right? They sort of look like um, a three part plus some torsion part. But modules over more general polynomial rings aren't as nice. So for this example, I'll describe the chain complex for you. 
Um, wait. Oh, so first, maybe let me remind you, right, we have these two variables, u and v, and we have these two gradings, grading of u and grading of v. And also, sometimes we want to consider some linear combination of these gradings, which is called the Alexander grading, which is uh, one half the u grading minus the v grading. And so, uh, wait, and then this is um, minus one and one. Okay, so the, the chain complex that we're going to associate to the right-handed trestle oil, well, it has three generators, A, B, and C, and um, I've computed the gradings as follows. And then maybe a nice exercise would be for you to fill these in. Um, great, and then, so this is a chain complex, so I should tell you what the boundary map is. And the boundary of A is zero. The boundary of B is uh, UA plus VC. And the boundary of C is zero. Um, great. Does someone want to tell me what to fill in here? Great. One, zero, minus one. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> OK. So, right. So, I guess maybe, maybe I should back up, right? When I talked about these three manifold invariants, right? So we describe our three manifold in some way, and out of that data, we build a chain complex. The chain complex might depend on a lot of, a lot of choices that we made, but the chain homotopy type of that chain complex is an invariant of the three manifold. Similarly, well, to or, um, to or not, well, we get a chain complex over this polynomial ring in two variables, and the chain homotopy type of that complex is an invariant of the isotopy class of our not. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then, yes. Great. Yes. Great. Yeah. <laughs> by the end of today, I'll remember it. Well, by the end of today, I probably won't remember to repeat questions, but we can still try. Yeah, so the differential has grading uh, minus one, minus one. This is a curly D. Okay. More questions. Oh, what about the Maslow grading? Yeah, so the thing, if, the thing that I'm calling the U grading, that's the Maslow grading. Um, great. More questions? All right. Um, great. So, <clears throat> not floor homology has lots of wonderful properties. I'm going to tell you about two of those wonderful properties. Um, so, the first wonderful property is that uh, not floor homology. Um, so there's not flow homology comes in various flavors. So the flavor called HFK hat, um, this categorifies the Alexander polynomial. Great. Okay. Um, so first of all, what is HFK hat? Um, Wait, so I had this chain complex over this ring F adjoin UV, and then maybe you're like, oh, like, that's way too complicated. I don't want a chain complex over a polynomial ring. I just want a chain complex over a field. Well, we can do that. Let's just set U and V equal to zero, and now we have a chain complex over um, just F. Okay, so uh, set U equal to zero and V equal to zero um, on, on the chain level. So on the chain level. Great. Um, well, we'll get out of the chain complex. And then, so the next step is, well, now you have this chain complex over a field. And then take the homology um, right, okay, and you still, you still have your, your gradient data. Um, so you take homology, and then you, that the, what you get is denoted HFK hat. Um, <clears throat> so we'll use, we'll use this grading and this grading. I mean, it's like the same information as using like these two, but that's just sort of how it works. Um, so we'll use the Maslow grading, and we'll use the Alexander grading. And then, um, it, right, so this is a, so now this is going to be a bi-graded vector space. So we'll just write it like this. So the subscript will denote the Maslow grading, and then 
This will denote the Alexander gradient. <coughs> so this is a bi-graded vector space, and if you have a bi-graded vector space, you can take the graded Euler characteristic. So we'll treat M as like a um, homological gradient, and then we'll record the Alexander gradient with the, um, with the variable. <coughs> so what, is, what does that mean? It means that the Alexander polynomial of K, it's, um, so you sum over the Alexander grading, and then you record that with the T to the A, and then uh, you take the alternating sum over the Maslow grading. Okay, and so um, as an exercise, so I'll put the answer on the board, and I encourage you to check this in your own time. Well, well, I'll just say it out loud, right? If you set u and v equal to zero, so the differential becomes trivial, so everything is in the kernel and nothing is in the image. Uh, yes? Oh, yes, it should be the dimension. <laughs> the question was, should, should it have been the dimension of HFK hat? And it is, and now I've crammed in dimension right here. Thanks. Great. Okay, so you can check that it should look something like this. You get copies of F here. Right, and then you take the graded Euler characteristic. So this is an even Maslow grading, and it gets a um, t to the minus one. And this is an uh, odd Maslow grading, and then this is an even Maslow grading. And then, for those of you familiar with the Alexander polynomial, you say, ah, yes, that is the Alexander polynomial of the triple. All right, so that's the first wonderful property of not for Yes. Oh, the question from the chat is, does this exist for links as well as knots? Uh, the answer is yes. There's various ways you can do it. You can maybe get a U and a V for each link component if you want. Um, uh, yes, and it's powerful, has lots of wonderful properties, which I won't discuss this week. Other questions? Okay. Um, Great. Second wonderful property of Knopfler homology is that it detects genus. Great. Okay. So um, let's take the. Um, uh, we'll use the symmetrized Alexander polynomial. So sort of the highest positive degree will match the highest negative degree. Um, great. And then you can write your Alexander polynomial uh, as. Great. Okay. And then um, the genus of K is uh, bounded below by the largest I such that um, AI is not zero. Great. So the Alexander polynomial on its own gives us a bound on the genus. And then, um, well, not flow homology improves this to actually detecting the genus. This is a result due to Oshroth and Zabo. Um, which says that uh, the genus of K is actually equal to the um, largest Alexander grading such that um, the Knopfler homology is non-zero in that Alexander grading. Oh, I said I was, I'm actually going to tell you three wonderful properties about Knopfler homology. The last one is that Knopfler homology detects fibredness. Um, so uh, the Alexander polynomial obstructs fibredness, um, right? So recall that if uh, a knot is fibered, then the Alexander polynomial is monic. <coughs> Great. And so, well, when you, when you lift this to not flow homology, what it tells you is um, that, uh, right, so this is a theorem of Gagini and Ni. Um, so K is fibered uh, if and only if the not flow homology in the highest Alexander grading, which is necessarily the genus 
right, by the second wonderful property. Um, uh, well, this is just a single copy of F. Right? So certainly this implies that the Alexander polynomial is monic, but in Nuffler homology, this is actually like a different only F statement. <coughs> All right, so um, that was sort of the overview of the um, form and properties of these invariants. Um, before I sort of dive into the definition, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, so this is the genus in S. Oh. The question was, am I talking about the smooth genus or the topological genus? Um, this is the cipher genus in S3. Um, so, the, so, so there's not a distinction. Um, yeah. This is a, the genus. The minimal genus of a cipher surface in S3 whose boundary is the knot. More questions? Oh, um, right, so you might, cipher genus is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the question was, what do I mean about cipher genus? What other kinds of genus are there? Um, right, so the cipher genus is you look for a surface in S3. You could also think about S3 as a boundary of B4 and say look for the minimal genus of a properly embedded surface in B4 whose boundary is your knot in S3. And then when you look at surfaces in a four manifold like that, then there is a distinction between if your surface is topologically embedded or smoothly embedded. Um, so. More questions? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> the question was, in the theorem about genus, when you look at HFK hat of k comma a, do you sum over all Maslow gradings? And the answer is yes. All right. So now I want to um, give a sketch of how these invariants are defined. Um, it's, it'll be a sketch, so it'll be sort of a jumping off point for you to go and sort of read the definitions deeper. Um, I'm not capable of giving you a complete um, introduction in three lectures to all of Hagar for homology. Okay, so I want to talk about Hagar diagrams, right? So the <coughs> The deal is, well, we need to describe our three manifolds somehow, and then from that description, we feed that into some machine that spits out a chain complex whose chain homotopy type is an invariant of our three manifolds. So the input into this machine is going to be a Hager diagram. OK, so first I want to talk about handle bodies. Right? OK, so let's take a handle body. So here, this is a three ball. And like I want to carry my three ball amount of me, so like I need some handles on it. So here's. Right, and maybe maybe I have a friend, and my friend also wants to carry it sometimes. Um, right, so there's two handles on this. So this is a hand, this this here is a handle body of genus two. Um, we just care about these things up to homeomorphism. So, um, for example, right. Um, so here I'm imagining this as um, sort of filled in. Right, this is filled in. This is a handle body of genus three. Okay, so while well, I said we cared about um, closed three manifolds, well, these have boundary, but pretty soon they won't. Um, so uh, a Hagar splitting of a three manifold is a decomposition of your three manifold into a union of two handle bodies. So definition. Uh, Hagar splitting of a three manifold Y is a decomposition of Y into two handle bodies. Um, I heard from Melissa Zhang that she likes to call 
well, you have to call these, we have two handle bodies. So it's a handle body and it's its handle buddy. They like, come together. <clears throat> Great. All right. So we want, we want an invariant that's going to be able to describe any three manifold. So maybe the first thing you might wonder is, well, <clears throat> does every three manifold admit such a, such a splitting? Um, the answer is yes. So theorem, every closed oriented three manifold admits a Hagard splitting. Um, great, so what's, what's the proof? Well, um, okay, well if you believe that every three manifold can be triangulated, right? Um, so for one of your handle bodies, take a neighborhood of the one skeleton. For the other handle body, um, take a neighborhood of the dual one skeleton. So that's the one skeleton whose vertices are like centers of your tetrahedron and then whose edges sort of go through each face perpendicularly. Um, and then you can check, well, <laughs> right, a neighborhood of a one skeleton, well, that's gonna be a, a handle body. And so that gives you your hate guard decomposition. Great. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Um, wait, uh, in my notes I've been numbering my examples and we're on five now, maybe? Wait, <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's talk about a Hagard splitting of S3. One way to think about S3 is as um, R3 union of point at infinity. <clears throat> okay, so um, I had the chalk. Okay, so for one of my for one of my handle bodies, I'll take a um, one of my handle bodies is going to be a neighborhood of the z-axis together with a point at infinity. I'm going to draw it in blue, even though blue looks like white. Um, okay. So imagine, right? So you have a neighborhood of the z-axis. Well, the z-axis together with a point at infinity is a circle, and then you take a neighborhood of that that's going to be a solid torus. Um, so one of so one of our handle bodies is a neighborhood of the z-axis union infinity, and then the other this is going to be our second handle body, and then the other handle body will be a neighborhood of the um, unit circle in the xy plane. will look something like this. Great, okay. And now maybe you stare at this long enough and you, you believe and this sort of fills in everything and then this is, describes um, S3, right? Here's one of our hand, this is here's one of our genus one handle bodies is this solid torus here and then the other one is sort of everything outside of here. Questions? Yes. Uh, so the question was, if we're triangulating things, that's the continuous case. How do we get there? How do we get to the smooth case? Um, I guess it depends. I guess it depends on what, what what definition of triangulation you're taking. But if sort of if if your triangulation is sort of like nice and finite everywhere, then there's there's not anything to worry about. Other questions? Okay, so this is a genus one Hagard splitting of S3. Um, now, well, there's also a genus two Hagard splitting of S3. So um, let me draw that. Okay, so. So here, here's your genus two handle body. 
and then sort of outside here is I claiming it's another genus two handle body. You could sort of, one way to think about it is that you could get from here to here just by sort of, well, tacking on like a extra handle onto this handle body here and then sort of a complement will kind of like go through it and give you, give you the rest. Um, okay, so we're gonna describe our three manifolds with via Hagard splittings. Um, but now the question is, well, like I'm drawing like this picture for you, like how, how, do we, how do we feed that picture into some machine that's gonna spit out a chain complex? Um, <clears throat> and so the point is that we can describe a Hager splitting with something called a Hager diagram. Um, so, uh, a Hager diagram is a triple, uh, so the triple denote with the math cal H, and it consists of a, of a closed oriented surface sigma together with um, a, a, a closed oriented surface of genus G together with a G tuple of alpha curves and a G tuple of beta curves um, such that All right, so uh, sigma is a closed oriented genus G surface. Um, alpha, okay, so this is a collection of G alpha circles. Um, so it's a set of pairwise uh, disjoint simple closed curves in sigma uh, such that the complement is connected. Great. And then um, the same the same for the betas. And right, so just repeat everything here, but just replace alpha with beta. Okay, so that's what a Hager diagram is. And the claim is that a Hager diagram um, describes a Hager splitting. So let me tell you how to, from this data, how to build a three manifold. So um, let's go over here and let's, Great, okay, so <clears throat> from this data, I'm gonna build you a three manifold. Um, so I'll give you the description and I'll give you a running example. All right, okay, so the data of a Hager diagram, okay, so here's a closed oriented genus two surface. So my, I need a pair of alpha curves. Um, alphas are always red and um, betas are always blue. Uh, you'll have to deal with the blue that doesn't really look blue, but these are blue. Right, so this is say alpha one, alpha two, beta one, Beta two. Okay. So to build a three manifold Y from this data, okay. Um, okay, so we're trying to build a three manifold. Well, this is the surface. So first, let's um, thicken sigma to sigma cross I. Right, and so my, my interval is um, zero, one. Okay, and now, right, okay, so now I have two boundary components. I have sigma cross zero and I have sigma cross one. And so um, along, on the sigma cross zero side, let's attach 
uh, D2 cross uh, interval along uh, each alpha i cross zero. <clears throat> okay, so like in this picture, um, imagine you've thickened the surface. I don't know how to draw that in a way that doesn't make the diagram look terrible. And then we'll think of the inside of that thickened surface as the sigma cross zero side. And so on the sigma on the inside, well, along each of these curves, I want to attach a thickened disk. So now, um, like this and this. Okay, and now because of this condition that the complement of the alpha curves is connected, what's going to happen is that what's left of the boundary on the inside is going to be um, S2. And so there's a unique way to fill that in with a three ball, right? So here, if you kind of look on the inside, there's like this part here. And so that, that boundary is an S2, and we'll fill that in with the three ball. So let's um, attach B3 to the resulting S2 boundary. Okay, and so um, basically these alpha curves are telling us how sigma bounds the handle body like on, on like the inside. Okay, and then the beta curves tell us how sigma bounds the handle body on the outside. So then the, the next step is you just, well, do, do the analogous thing on the outside. So now let's attach uh, D2 cross I to each beta I, now this is on the other side, um, and then, okay, so in my picture here, right, so we're attaching a thickened disk like along here, and also along here. Great, and now again, because the complement of the beta curves is connected, well, the resulting boundary is gonna be in S2, right? It's sort of, we sort of like, have like filled in the genus on this, and now here's an S2, and then we stick in a three ball whose boundary is that. Um, great. So now we attach a B3 along the resulting S2 boundary. Questions? Yes. Uh, so the definition here, the question was the definition here, um, the alphas and betas, they don't need to intersect. That's correct. Uh, yeah, yeah, so in principle, so for example, here's a perfect, the question was, so in principle, the beta circles could be the alpha circles. Um, yes, so for example, uh, if, you, if you're just talking about a Hagar diagram, then for example, um, this is a perfectly good Hagar diagram. So there's my alpha, here's my beta. Um, uh, later when you get to talking about associating a chain complex to this, it turns out this diagram won't be one, we'll have to sort of wiggle things around gently. But if you're just a three manifold topologist talking about a Hagar diagram, this is a perfectly good Hagar diagram. And a good exercise to check to see if you are following is to try to determine what the manifold this describes. When is it true that alpha and beta are a basis for the first homology? Um, and the answer is always. Um, uh, never. Never. Great. <laughs> um, that's right. Right. So uh, H1 of a genus G surface. Uh, oh, so you want, if you, wait. Okay. If you, if you want to look at, sorry, it's neither always nor never. If you look at, okay, if you look at just the alpha circles, that's never going to be a basis because you only have G of them and you need two G elements. Um, it is true that if the, since this complement is um, connected, the alphas are always going to be linearly independent and the beta is always going to be linearly independent, and then sort of that, that's what you get, and then like besides that, sort of anything can happen, right? So here, they're not a basis, and then um, there they are. So sort of anything can happen from like basis to not basis.
how, the question is, how does the S2 boundary come up? Um, yeah, so it, it follows from the condition that the complement of the alphas is connected, that um, the boundary is going to be S2. So um, you can do like an Euler characteristic argument, or there's probably other ways to see that. Um, so that follows from this condition. More questions? Terrific. OK. So <clears throat> wait. OK, so well, this is a Hager diagram for S3. Um, uh, this is also a Hager diagram for S3. Okay, so <clears throat> okay, so we can see just by example that it's possible to have more than one Hager diagram for the same three manifold. Um, however, we have the following nice theorem that says that uh, any two Hager diagrams for the same three manifold. Um, are related by a sequence of the following moves. Okay, so the first one is isotopy. You're allowed to just like wiggle your curves around. So the first is isotopy. So for example, right, suppose this is your Hagar diagram. Well, you can you can wiggle your curves around. So maybe now my maybe now my alpha curve looks like this. And now maybe my Beta curve looks like this. Great. And that's going to describe the same three manifold. All right. That's the first so called Hagerd move. Um, the second is called a handle slide. So let's suppose we have this diagram. So, um, okay, so a handle slide. What's my favorite way to think about a handle slide? Okay, so let's, let's slide this beta curve over this other beta curve. Okay, so, so that means that this beta curve is the only one that's going to change. So this one stays here. And so how do I think about that? Well, I think about that, okay, first, let's do like an isotopy so it's really close to the other beta curve. And then once you get really close, now then just like um, tag on to like a parallel copy of the other one. So, so the result is going to look like this. So, yes. Yes, you can. The question is, can you isotope each alpha curve and each beta curve separately? Um, and yes, you can. Other questions? Great. And okay, so if you notice, um, neither isotopy nor handle slides change the genus of a surface. But well, for these two examples of Hager diagrams for S3, they had different genera. So we better have a move that change that can change the genus. And um, that's stabilization and destabilization. So stabilization increases the genus by one, and um, destabilization decreases the genus by one. So let's say, let's say your Hager diagram um, looks like this. Great. So you can think about. Uh, you can think about stabilization as um, you, okay, 
so this part stays the same. And then um, over on the other side, you just get sort of this standard thing. And sort of, you should, a good exercise would be to sort of check that, well, the three manifold you build associated to this is the same as when you get to this. But spoiler, this is just sort of S3. So, wait. Questions? Yes. Oh, can you, all, the question is, can you also just apply self diffeomorphisms of the surface? Um, yeah, uh, they, I mean, yes, that won't change the three manifold. Um, but the statement here is that these three moves are sufficient to get between any two um, Hegel diagrams for the same three manifold. Other questions? Yeah, but actually, going back to the question, um, so yes, you can always apply a self diffeomorphism to the surface. So in fact, using that fact, you can actually deduce that if you want to, you can always choose, say, your alpha circles to be in standard position. So like, this is what I call standard position. If you do that, it might be at the cost of the beta circles become like all interesting and jumbled up, but you can always choose either your alpha curves or your beta curves to be in standard position if you so desire. Other questions? Oh, how do we, the question is, how do we get the orientation of the three manifold from the diagram? Um, uh, maybe I didn't say it, but you start off with an oriented surface, and then if you take an oriented surface across an interval, that gets an, that, well, the orientation of your surface induces an orientation on this product, and then that gives you an orientation sort of on, on everything. Um, yeah, so maybe a, a, good, a good exercise to um, understand how you get these three manifolds. So you should think about, well, what happens, if I what happens if I reverse the orientation of sigma? What three manifold do I get there relative to the original orientation? And also, um, say if I swap the roles of alpha and beta, what does that do to my three manifold? More questions? Yes. Oh, do I require alpha and beta to be oriented? No. Other questions? Yes. Ah, does the handle slide change the conditions that the alpha and beta curves are going to satisfy? Uh, no. Um, so that's a good exercise to check that if if the complement of the, alpha, of the beta curves is connected, well, after you do a handle slide, the complement of the beta curves is still going to be connected. Excellent questions. More questions? No more questions. I'm going to carry on. OK. So, so now you can, maybe, you can maybe understand at least sort of the big picture of how we can use this to get a three-manifold invariant. Right? So to a Hager from a Hager diagram, we're going to build a chain complex. And then, well, you just show, OK, you just show that the chain homotopy type of that chain complex doesn't change under any of these three moves. And then, then you're happy you've gotten yourself a three manifold invariant. OK. Great. So the plan is that to a Hager diagram, we'll associate a chain complex um, such that the chain homotopy type is independent of whatever choices that we made. So <coughs> e.g., in particular, we'll show that it's invariant under Hagard, uh, Hagard moves. OK, great. Um, uh, for technical reasons, we actually need to put a base point on our Hager diagram. So it's like literally just like you put a point and give it a label. Um, and, then, and then you, okay, you isotopies are not allowed to cross the base point and your handle slides can't like go over the base point. Um, wait, so this is, uh, wait, so for technical reasons, um, We need a base point. Uh, it's going to live in the complement of the alpha and beta circles. Um, and the Hagard moves 
uh, must uh, miss the base point. Um, but even if you restrict your Haggard moves to ones that miss the base point, you can still, um, if two three manifolds, if two Haggard diagrams describe the same three manifolds, you can still get to them by a sequence. You can get between them by a sequence of Haggard moves that misses the base point. All right. Questions? Yes. Uh, the question is, do we get an interesting theory if we don't require a base point? Um, you get out something that determines the singular homology of your three manifolds. Um, is that interesting? Okay. So now I need to tell you how to build a chain complex from a Hagar diagram. Okay. Great. So we're going to build some complicated manifold. Then we're sort of going to do Lagrangian floor homology there. And that's how we get a chain complex. Um, okay. So what do we do? We look at the g-fold symmetric product of sigma. So that just means you take um, sigma cross itself g times, and then you mod out by the symmetric group on g elements. Um, Great, so this looks like unordered G tuples of points in your surface. Um, uh, it turns out that this is, in fact, a manifold um, because this is a surface. That's a nice exercise. OK, and now we're going to be interested in um, some subspaces of this G fold symmetric product. So the first subspace we're going to be interested in is. Um, T alpha, so it's just the product of the alpha circles, I guess T for torus. And similarly, we'll be interested in T beta, so it's the product of the beta circles. <coughs> okay, um, wait, so these are, uh, this is um, uh, real 2G dimensional, uh, these are each G dimensional. Um, well, uh, one more subspace we'll be interested in is um, VW. Uh, right, our base point I've named W. And then, so this is the base point. Um, VW is just, uh, right, so elements in here are unordered G triples of points in sigma. And this is just going to be um, at least one of your points is W. Um, okay, so these are two half-dimensional subspaces of sim G. So generically, they'll intersect in points, and those intersection points are going to be the generators for a chain complex. So, right, so to my Hagar diagram H, I'm associating a chain complex whose generators are uh, intersection points between T alpha and T beta. Right, so it's generated over this polynomial ring. <clears throat> okay. And now the, the differential is going to count um, pseudo-holomorphic disks. So, so first, um, wait, so let X and Y be uh, intersection points. So maybe, maybe like a Maybe I should also draw a cartoon. OK, so I'm drawing on a board, which is two-dimensional. So if I want to draw two half-dimensional subspaces, they'll be one-dimensional. So my cartoon will look something like this. Say this is T alpha. Say this is T beta. <coughs> Great. OK. 
Um, so this is going to be uh, homotopy classes of uh, Whitney disks from x to y. So what do I mean by that? OK, so let's take a um, unit disk in the complex plane. And I'm going to decorate my unit disk so that sort of this right side of it is red, and the left side of it is this blue slash white color. And then, wait, so here I have this disk. <coughs> Great. OK. And I want to map this into sim G. Um, so that like these decorations match, right? So that like this right-hand boundary should go to the alpha torus, this left-hand boundary should go to the beta torus, and then I guess this should be x and this should be y. Great. Okay. Um, all right, and we can we can put some extra structure on things, so we can put. Um, we can put an almost complex structure on this. And then we can look at, um, wait, so let's say we have phi in here. Well, we can look at the uh, moduli space of uh, pseudo-holomorphic uh, disks in the uh, homotopy class of phi. OK. And then um, this moduli space has some R action, which we can mod out by. So I might also talk about m hat of phi. And that's just this um, moduli space modded up by um, this R action. OK. So, so all this stuff is going to give us a differential. And so now, well, the boundary of x, well, we're going to sum over all other generators y and um, sum over all phi in pi 2 of x, y. Um, great, and then we have some condition on phi. And then we're going to count points in this moduli space. <coughs> and then uh, we also count with the u variable how many times we cross the w base point. Um, that's the coefficient of y. Ah, great. What is mu? That's an excellent question. Um, I have not told you. So mu of phi um, is the expected dimension of um, the moduli space of uh, holomorphic representatives of phi. So we want this moduli space to be one dimensional. And then we're modding out by this R action. So when you mod out by this R action, you get a zero dimensional space. And so we're, those are just points. And so this part is just counting points. Um, even better, we're working over F2. So our points don't even come with orientation. If you really cared, they could come with orientation. But I don't care enough. The whole theory works over Z um, with a lot more pain. And you still get a lot of mileage out of it just using um, Z mod 2 coefficients. And so I'm happy to use Z mod 2 coefficients. What is the, oh, ah, yes, what is NW phi? That is a great question, but I did not tell you. So NW of phi, um, this is the, OK, so it's like counting. Uh, it's the algebraic intersection number uh, between, right, so this, this sort of, this VW 
um, and the and the um, and the image of B. Other questions? Yes. Uh, how does this whole thing depend on the almost complex structure that we chose? Um, uh, it doesn't depend on the almost complex structure up to homotopy. Yeah, so that's another choice that we made. Yes. What about the spin C structure that's associated to inter intersection points? Um, yeah, so this, this chain comp, right. So a spin, spin C structures on three manifolds are in bijection with H lower one. So if you don't know what a spin C structure is, well, just they're in one to one correspondence with classes of H1. And um, the, this chain complex splits along spin C structures. So this chain complex splits as a direct sum over spin C structures. And then, well, the differential then preserves the spin C structure. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question was, um, if we think about these disks in sigma rather than in sim g, do we get g disks in sigma? Um, in some instances, you might, but you can also get more complicated things. You can get things that look like um, uh, branched covers of disks. In, in, like in, in sigma, it might look like a branched cover of a disk, but in sim g, it actually looks like a disk. Um, more questions? Yes. Right. So the question is, what are the precise combinatorial conditions we need to compute the Maslow index of a disk in the diagram, say, in genus 2? Um, right. So there's, right, so like Robert Lipschitz has a formula that gives you sort of um, an expectation of what the Maslow index will be. Um, but it's hard in general. It's also hard in general to know if a disk has a holomorphic representative. Um, and so if you're like me, um, you very, very rarely compute this invariant from the definition. Um, yeah. Other questions? Wait. Um, maybe one question you might have, well, I have this differential. Um, does it square to 0? It does square to 0. Um, and the reason that it squares to zero is sort of similar to the, it's the same, morally it's the same idea as in Morse homology, why, why the differential in Morse homology squares to zero. More questions? All right, let's, yes. How are the x's and y's being indexed, which means degree? This is, yeah, so this is a graded chain complex. Um, you can use sort of the dimension of this moduli space to sort of give you the, um, the relative grading, so maybe the difference of gradings between two generators. And then to pin that down to an absolute grading um, is hard. You have to look at cobordism maps. Um, all right. Um, those are all great questions. Uh, let's look at some examples. Um, let's look at some genus one examples. Why are genus one examples great? Well, sim one of a surface is just the surface itself. So if we look at genus one examples, you don't have to actually do anything too horrible. Great. All right. So. Let's start with S3. That's a great three manifold. Okay. All right. 
so. And I need a base point and the complement of the. Oh, wait. Um, so, how many generators does my chain complex here have? Wait, one. This one intersection point. I'll call it X. Um, wait. So, this chain complex, I'll call this H1, uh, is generated by X. Uh, what's the differential in this chain complex going to be? Zero. Right, um, yeah, there's, there's no disks here. I, uh, I guess another, the differential, there's a grading that I haven't really told you much about, but the different, differential lowers the grading, so if you only have a thing in one grading, you can't have any differential. So the differential is zero. Great, so now I take the homology of this thing. That gives me uh, what's called HF minus. Okay, well, the homology of this thing, I have a single generator and no differential, so it's just gonna be F adjoin U, and then, um, for S3, this is just like, right, you have to, we have to normalize our grading somehow, so this is just declared that one is in grading zero. Great. All right. Um, what if we chose a different Hager diagram for S3? Uh, I still want to stick with genus one so we don't have to actually take the symmetric product of anything. So, let's take this. All right, so let's call this H2. Um, how many generators is this chain complex going to have? Three, there's three intersection points, so let's label them A, B, C. <clears throat> All right, and now, great, so now we have to compute the differential. So we're like looking for disks in our picture that have like these decorations. So on the, they go from X to Y, and as you like leave X to the right, you see a red alpha curve, and to the left, you see a bluish white beta curve. Okay, um, so does anyone see such a disk in this picture? And if so, from where to where does it go? Yeah, B goes to C, right? So right here, right, these decorations line up, and then for whatever Riemann mapping theorem reasons, this does indeed have a holomorphic representative. Okay, so that means that C appears in the um, boundary of C appears in the boundary of B. Does anyone see any other disks? Uh, sure. Great. B goes to A, right? And um, do I need, do I just put a B, uh, B goes to A, so I just put an A here, or do I need some decoration on it? Right, it crosses, this one crosses W, right? And so, um, if you cross W, you have to count that with your variable U. So it gets, a, there's a U here. Right, and then you can check that, um, that's it. So these are both uh, DC and DA are zero. Great, and then um, it's an exercise for you to check that well, the homology of the thing, well, it better match up with that. Um, and I guess you can check, right? So uh, A and C are in the kernel. And then, well, the image is C plus UA. And then um, this is isomorphic to F adjoin U, uh, say, generated by A. Right, you might say, well, what happened to C? Well, it's generated over F adjoin U by A, and we'll work, uh, C is homologous to U times A. Oh, how do we normalize the grading? Yeah, for S3, this is just declared, one is declared to be in grading zero. Um, that's, like the, that's like the normalization here. But for other, for other three manifolds, um, right, so the way the gradings are defined, right, for S3, one is declared to be in grading zero, and then for these cobordism maps, 
you can compute the grading shift associated to any cobordism map, and then you look at cobordisms from S3 to whatever manifold you want, and then if you knew the, then, and then that tells you how to grade sort of the other end of that cobordism. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so the question was, um, then, so now HF plus of S3, um, that the, that's sort of the bottom element there has grading two. Yeah, and that was sort of the disclaimer I muttered at the beginning that I'm using these grading conventions, but they differ in the literature sometimes. Um, yeah. Uh, why am I using these grading conventions? Um, it makes things like the Kunz formula nicer. Um, it's just sort of satisfying for like H of minus of S3 to sort of have this grading. Great. Okay. Um, Great, and so then um, the important theorem due to Oshroff and Zabo is that this really is a two manifold invariant. Uh, so let H be a pointed, pointed just means you have that base point. So let H be a pointed Hager diagram for Y. chain homotopy type of CF minus of H is an invariant of Y. So um, often I might abuse notation and write this as CF minus of Y, where I just mean the right, chain homotopy type. Yes, orientation preserving the morphism invariant, yeah. Other questions? Okay. Um, more examples. So, great. So, Here's another wonderful three manifold uh, Hager diagram. A good exercise would be to um, determine what three manifold this is. Um, uh, I'll just tell you, it's, it's RP3. So you should check to see if you believe me. <coughs> okay. So there's two generators, X and Y. Um, you can check that there's no, there's no disks. So the boundary of X is zero and the boundary of Y is zero. So this tells us that the um, Hagerful homology of RP3, well, it's um, F join U uh, plus F join U, where here all in, intentionally omit saying what the gradings are. Um, great. So I guess I'll say a little bit about spin C structures. So some remarks. Uh, HF minus it splits as a direct sum over spin C structures. So, right, and if you don't like spin C structures, well, these are in one to one correspondence with classes in H lower one of Y. Um, right, so, it splits as this direct sum. And then maybe the second remark is that if you have a rational homology sphere, um, you get uh, that the Hager flow homology has sort of a standard form. So if Y is a rational homology sphere, okay, right, the Hager flow homology, well, it's a um, we have this chain complex over F would join U. If we want, we can invert U, i.e., we can tensor 
with f adjoin u, u inverse. And that gives us this thing called HF infinity. Um, wait, so HF infinity, it's, we'll just take HF minus, and then this is the f adjoin u module. So tensor with f adjoin u, u inverse. Um, so the statement is that if y is a vaginal homology sphere, this thing always just looks like um, f adjoin u, u inverse. Um, wait, so in, the, in this, in this RP3 example, <coughs> um, right, so there, well, each lower one of RP3 um, is C mod 2. So, right, this splits as a direct sum of these two pieces. I'll just call it S1 plus HF minus of RP3, S2. Wait, and then um, because of this fact that, so the point, the point is that those two F adjoin U summons, they live in different spin C structures. So, so sort of for RP3, this is um, isomorphic to F adjoin U, and this is isomorphic to F adjoin U. And maybe let's uh, contrast that with the next example. Um, so let's look at S, S2 cross S1. Um, for technical reasons, we have to, we have, to um, have some intersection points in our diagram. So even though the alpha and beta curves are isotopic to one another, we'll, we'll, we'll just like isotope them so there's some intersections. Oops. Okay, so this is called H4. And now, uh, wait, so how many generators do I have? Two. Wait, so let's put my base point here. So call this X and call this why? Okay. Um, disks from X to Y. Um, can someone want to describe one? Okay. It's, I saw this. I, I, I'm taking this to mean this. There's this disk that goes around the back and comes over here. So that's a disk from X to Y. Um, does anyone see another disk from X to Y? Um, yeah. So I saw this. <laughs> I saw this. And like, like, come on. Like this one right here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, there's two of them. We're working Z mod two, so they cancel out. So the boundary of X, well, it's Y plus Y, but that's zero mod two. And then the boundary of Y is zero. Great, so um, HF minus of this example, uh, it's also um, two copies of F adjoin U. Um, it turns out that these two generators live in the same spin C structure. Um, so really, uh, what this is saying is that uh, HF minus of S2 cross S1 in, what I'll, in the spin C structure that I'll label S0. Uh, this is two copies of F adjoin U. And um, just the, con the the fact is that um, the grading of one in one of the copies is one half, and the grading of one in the other copy is minus one half. Um, great. All right. So maybe I will conclude with. Um, people are happy that I just declare those. Yeah, so there's just two more properties that I want to tell you about, and then I'll wrap up. Um, so the first property, oh, there's a question. Yes. Yeah. 
great, yeah. The point W is outside, and what if it was in between? That would change, it would sort of, yeah. So there was this condition. Um, there's something called admissibility. Um, this is an admissible diagram. Um, it's a, admissibility is a condition on what's called periodic domains. Those are regions in the Hagar diagram whose boundary are full alpha circles and full beta circles. And the condition on admissibility would say that if you put the W in there, it wouldn't be admissible anymore. Great. Okay. Um, all right, so the first property I want to tell you about is that what happens if you reverse the orientation on Y. Um, great, well, um, you just take the dual of the chain complex. So uh, maybe I'll put a spin structure here. Um, so if you reverse the orientation on Y, well then, uh, that's chain home, which will be equivalent to just the dual. So you just look at uh, U-equivalent homomorphisms from this chain complex to this ring. And so maybe I'll, maybe I'll sometimes just denote this uh, with a star, this is a note dual. Okay, so, so for the three minimum fold invariant, if you reverse the orientation, sort of nice controlled things happen. And then what's, the, what's another nice operation you might want to do on three minimum folds? You might want to take the connected sum. And so if you take the connected sum, um, uh, you also get a nice relationship. Um, there's a Kunz type formula, which just says that the chain complex associated to the connected sum is chain homotopy equivalent to the tensor product of the respective chain complexes, where again, uh, the tensor product happens over the ground ring. Um, so this is sort of a Kunz type formula. Great, and that's 1031, but I think I started at 901. Thanks for your attention. Yes. Right, so the question was, to try to understand this Kronos formula, well, could you just take the connected sum of two diagrams? Um, yes. So there's a, there's a variant, um, HF hat, uh, sort of is like the simplest form of Hager flow homology. And in that, you just obtain the chain complex for HF hat by setting uh, u equal to zero. And so in HF hat, then what you said like totally works, right? You just take the connected sum near the base point well, if you set u equal to zero, that meant you were never allowed to cross the base point. So taking the connected sum, well, like you're changing some stuff, but you were never allowed to like go there anyway, so it's all okay. Um, yeah, so for, for the hat flavor of Hager full homology, yep, that exactly works. For the minus flavor, well, now you're allowed to cross the base point. So now, I don't, maybe you like stretch the neck or you do something complicated to make it work and it all works, but. Okay, so are there um, analogous results for, uh, for the genus detection result for null homologous knots and other three manifolds? Um, yes, and sort of there's uh, generalization. In fact, um, Hager flow homology detects the Thurston norm, and that's sort of if you can you can view sort of the genus detection results as sort of a yeah, specialization of that. Could I say one sentence briefly about the one half and the minus one half? Um, well, okay, you know, you maybe you're not happy that these are rational numbers, but you should be happy that they differ by one because um, the relative grading of two generators, well, since there's a you know, disk of that index connecting them, then these differ by one. Um, and that was one sentence.